Where is my Lord? They have taken him away. All I see is a tomb, a place that is empty. And just when I need him and long for his voice, even his body would not wait for my tears. Shut away in a box, he has conquered their coffin. Shut away in a book, he fulfills living word. Shut away in our concepts, he shatters such shackles. No prison can hold him, no tomb thwart the miracle. His life is our liberty, his love changed my life. No dying can rob me of what he has given. Once blind, now I see. Hallelujah, his promise. In the day when the hearts of people fail them for fear, then look up, little flock, your redemption draws near. Your only Son, no sin to hide, but you have sent him from your side to walk upon this guilty sod and to become the Lamb of God. Your gift of love they crucified, they laughed and scorned him as he died. The humble king they named a fraud, and sacrificed the Lamb of God. O Lamb of God, sweet Lamb of God, I love the Holy Lamb of God. O wash me in His precious blood, my Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. I was so lost, I should have died, but you have brought me to your side, to be led by your staff and rod, and to be called a Lamb of God. O Lamb of God, sweet Lamb of God, I love the Holy Lamb of God. O oh, wash me in His precious blood, my Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. O oh, Lamb of God, sweet Lamb of God, I love the Holy Lamb of God. O oh, wash me in his precious blood, my Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. Christ is risen. He is, he is risen, risen indeed. indeed. Hallelujah. Leap and spin, you powers of heaven. Burst into explosive songs of joy. All you companies of angels, let the throne of God be surrounded with praises of all that has life. The earth glories in her maker. Now mountain and valley glow in splendor. The sea on the shore whispers the praises of Jesus. Rivers stream through thirsty so soil, bringing news of gladness. The Redeemer is risen. His glory fills the earth. The trees thunder their praises and loudly clap their hands. Sound a trumpet through all the earth. Our morning star is alive. Risen in splendor, he is among us. The darkness is driven back. We, his people, join in the dance of all creation. We, we praise, praise the blood of the Lamb that has brought our freedom and reverse the curse of disobedience and willfulness. Jesus is the true Lamb that was slain. 
whose blood is on the door of our hearts, whose blood is in the protection of the homes of all believers. May the Son of Justice, which never sets, find this flame still burning. May Christ, the morning star who came from the dead, find his light brightly burning in our hearts. In, in us, Lord, let there be light. Psalms 116, verse 1 through 2, and verse 12 through 19. I love the Lord because he has heard my voice and my supplications. Because he inclined his ear to me, therefore I will call on him as long as I live. What shall I return to the Lord for all his bounty to me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his faithful ones. O Lord, I am your servant. I am your servant, the child of your serving girl. You have loosed my bonds. I will offer to you a thanksgiving sacrifice and call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people, in the courts of the house of the Lord, in your midst, O Jerusalem. Praise the Lord. Hello, everyone. Happy Easter from the Horseshoe Ranch. Exodus 14, verses 15 through 22. Then the Lord said to Moses, Why do you cry out to me? Tell the Israelites to go forward. But you lift up your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it, that the Israelites may go into the sea on dry ground. Then I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians so that they will go in after them. And so I will gain glory for myself over Pharaoh and all his army, his chariots and his chariot drivers. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord. When I have gained glory for myself over Pharaoh, his chariots and his chariot drivers. The angel of God who was going before the Israelite army moved and went behind them. And the pillar of cloud moved from in front of them and took its place behind them. It came between the army of Egypt and the army of Israel. And so the cloud was there with the darkness, and it lit up the night. One did not come near the other all night. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea. The Lord drove the sea back by a strong east wind all night and turned the sea into dry land and the waters were divided. The Israelites went into the sea on dry ground, the waters forming a wall for them on their right and on their left. Colossians 3, 1 through 11. So if you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, whatever is in you is earthly, fornication, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming on those who are disobedient. These are the ways you also once followed when you were living that life. But now you must get rid of all such things, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and abusive language from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have stripped off the old self with its practices and have clothed yourselves with the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge according to the image of its creator. In that renewal, there is no Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave and free, but Christ is all and in all.
Be with me, Lord, I cannot live without thee. I dare not try to take one step alone. I cannot bear the loads of life unaided. I need thy strength to lean myself upon. Be with me, Lord, and then if dangers threaten, if storms of trial burst above my head, if flashing seas leap everywhere about me, they cannot harm or make my heart afraid. Be with me, Lord, no other gift or blessing Thou couldst bestow, could with this one compare A constant sense of thy abiding presence Where'er I am, to feel that thou art near Be with me, Lord, when loneliness o'ertakes me When I must weep amid the fires of pain and when shall come the hour of my departure for worlds unknown o lord be with me then holy god we come to you confessing that even as we sing, I dare not try to take one step alone, we find ourselves turning right around and striking out on our own, in our own weakness and foolishness. We confess that as we are inundated with news of suffering and loss, we find ourselves too often turning that into concern of how this is affecting and inconveniencing us. God, we ask you to forgive us our foolish ways and selfish hearts. We ask that you give us eyes to see as you see. We ask that you give us hearts that break for what breaks your heart. We ask that you show us how you can minister to others through us. We ask that you give us faithful hearts to follow as you call us to serve others. And we ask that you light a fire in the hearts of those you're calling to lead in our little part of your kingdom. And that you give us discernment to recognize those you're calling for leadership. And God, right now, we ask that you heal and give relief to those sick and suffering, especially those under the weight of this pandemic. And that you give strength, health, endurance, and somehow joy and peace to those on the front lines. God, we are thankful. We're thankful for your goodness and your love that goes way beyond anything we can begin to understand. We're thankful for the blessings that come from having to slow down and focus on what is really important. We're thankful for new connections to others, even from a distance. And we're thankful for new family members, specifically Benjamin Weeb. Thank you. And God, we're especially thankful for an amazing God that you would give yourself for us and thankful for the hope we have because we serve a risen Savior. Wow, it leaves us speechless. So God, please accept our humble prayer through and because of Jesus who is alive. Amen. It's Saturday. This is a day that you have been waiting for for years. For three years, you have been studying Scripture. You've been examining your moral life. You've been learning how to live a new life, how to live a life that these Christians that you've come to know have asked you to live. A life different than the one that you've known in Rome around the year 200 AD. This is when your story 
truly begins is when you meet these Christians. And so for three years, you're studying. You're forming relationships with people who show you how to love properly, how to live a new kind of life. And so it's Saturday. It's the day before Easter. And you know you're about to do it. You're finally about to be baptized. On Thursday, you took the most extravagant bath you've probably ever taken in your life. And then since Friday, you and the people that have walked with you through this journey, through this studying, have been fasting. It's Friday and Saturday. And you know that soon, when the night falls, this Saturday, you're going to spend the whole night in prayer. And you will know that at dawn, you're going to be baptized. This is the ritual that we know the earliest Christians went through, at least as early as the second century. That it's not like what we're used to today, where some people say a prayer and invite Jesus into their heart or others uh, might study a little bit and become baptized. In the early church, you had to wait three years before you became a Christian under all sorts of uh, tremendous stresses, especially the threat of persecution from the empire. And then the night before that baptism, that Easter Sunday morning, you pray the whole night. And then when it's time for the ritual, you present yourself before the elders and you renounce Satan and you're anointed with oil and you're plunged into the water three times in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then the, the elder would anoint you with oil again, but it's oil of thanksgiving and they would dry you off and put you in white garments to symbolize the new life that you're leading. And then the bishop of the congregation would come and he would lay his hands on the heads of the newly baptized and pray over them. And finally, they'd be anointed a third time to represent a seal of the Holy Spirit. And after this, for the first time, after waiting for years, these new converts to Christianity would take the Lord's Supper together. And then they would follow this by drinking a cup of of water and milk mixed with hum honey to symbolize their entrance into the land flowing with milk and honey. Becoming a Christian in the early church, even under the threat of persecution, was serious business. It wasn't something that you just decided to do one day. It required a serious commitment from those who wanted to pursue this new way of life. And so when they get to baptism, it is pregnant with symbolism. It signifies an entirely new life, a transformation from darkness to light, from an immoral world to a moral one, from being lost to being saved. It is the most dramatic moment in the lives of these early Christians. But like I said at the beginning of my story, it's Saturday. We're waiting with our friends we're fasting. We're in this space of anticipation. Earlier, we read out of Exodus the story of the children of Israel crossing through the Red Sea. And if it's Saturday for us sitting there waiting to be baptized on Sunday, for the children of Israel, we haven't reached the other side yet. We're walking on dry land. Yeah, but there are these giant walls of water on either side of us, and we're wondering what's going to happen next. Will we be safe? Will we make it to the other side, to safety from Pharaoh's army? Will we make it to dry land? It's Saturday, and we're wondering what is going to happen to us after we're baptized on Sunday. We're walking through dry, the Dead Sea on dry land, and we're wondering what's on the other side. We're waiting on Saturday. We're waiting at the bottom of the Dead Sea. And when we think about that, this time of waiting, of wondering what's going to happen next, it feels pretty familiar, doesn't it? Because right now, where we are in life, it's Saturday. It's, it's, it's waiting at the bottom of the Dead Sea. 
It's Holy Saturday, wondering, is Jesus really going to rise from the dead like he said he would? We're waiting, we're wondering as we're stuck in our homes, as our lives have been put to a halt, as we're trying to figure out what is normal for us now. In all of this, we're waiting. We're wondering what's on the other side. What's going to happen next? And the truth is, and this is the benefit of living in 2020 and not um, in 33 or not with those Israelites in the Red Sea, we know what happens next. We know that after the dry land at the bottom of the Red Sea, there's safety on the other side. We know that as we're waiting for baptism on Saturday, on Sunday, there's the Lord's Supper and rejoicing. We know that as we're waiting to find out if Jesus raises from the dead or not on Holy Saturday, we know that on Sunday, he emerges from the tomb and rolls that stone away. So what's waiting for us on the other side is new life. New life, life like we've never experienced before. That's what's waiting for us on the other side. One of my favorite theologians, uh, his name is Jonathan Edwards, and a lot of you might be familiar with him. He's uh, supposed to be the greatest theologian in American history. And when you think of Jonathan Edwards, a lot of you might be familiar with his uh, sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. And it's a famous sermon that probably gets mischaracterized quite a bit. But his work and his theology is so much deeper than these hellfire and brimstone stories we tell about him. He was instrumental in this uh, first mass American movement called the Great Awakening, the first Great Awakening, that took place in the 1700s in the colonies. And it was Edwards' theology that undergirded this movement, where you'd have 20,000 people show up in a, in a field somewhere to hear preaching. Preaching probably better than the preaching you're hearing this morning. But people are hungering for something. They're hungering for this new life, this new experience with God. And so here is an excerpt from uh, one of his sermons uh, that i like to read to you. And I want you to see if you can capture this idea of new life that Edwards paints for us. He says this, Persons are first awakened with a sense of their miserable condition by nature. The danger they are in of perishing eternally. Some are more suddenly seized with convictions. Their consciences are suddenly smitten as if their hearts were pierced through with a dart. Others have awakenings that come upon them more gradually. They begin at first to be something more thoughtful and considerate, so as to come to a conclusion in their minds that it is their best and wisest way to delay no longer. So at the beginning uh, of my sermon, we're waiting on Saturday in 200 AD, and now in 1745, we're in a field convicted of our sin, and we're waiting for conversion. And then Edward says this, conversion is a great and glorious work of God's power, at once changing the heart and infusing life into the dead soul. Though that grace that is then implanted does more gradually display itself in some than in others. But as to fixing on the precise time when they put forth the very first act of grace, there is a great deal of difference in different persons. In some, it seems to be very discernible when the very time of this was, but others are more at a loss. In some, converting light is like a glorious brightness suddenly shining in upon a person and all around him. They are in a remarkable manner brought out of darkness and into marvelous light. In many others, it has been like the dawning of the day, when at first but a little light appears, and it may be presently hid with a cloud, and then it appears again and shines a little brighter. We're waiting for, for baptism on Sunday. We're, ready, we're waiting for safety as we're walking along the bottom of the Red Sea, but then on that Sunday, when Jesus rises from the dead, on that day when we experience that new life, the great and glorious work of God's power at once changes our hearts and fuses life into the dead soul. 
I love Edwards' words. It's just this beautiful picture of what happens uh, to us when we step into this new life that Easter is all about. When we move away from Saturday and waiting to Sunday morning and new life. And yes, it feels like we're waiting right now. We're in the space where we're wondering what's going to happen next. Where is safety for us? What is going to happen on Sunday morning? But we're already beginning to see signs of life, signs of promise. We see uh, the spring around us, the leaves of the trees coming, the flowers opening up. We're blessed with the news that Benjamin Weeb uh, is now a part of our congregation, and we're so thankful and we're so excited for Mark and Jocelyn and Isla and Margo. We can't wait to be part of this journey um, that Benjamin is embarking on in this life. But we have these signs of new life all around us, these signs that there is safety on the other side, that we will get baptized on Sunday, that we will experience this conversion the next day, that there is an empty tomb. This is this, this moment of, of experiencing new life in Christ is what has empowered Christians throughout the millennia, or the last two millennia throughout the centuries to follow him in amazing ways. And I've tried to recount uh, some of those things briefly. And so as we're sitting here in our own moment of worrying and wondering what's going to happen when this is all over, the answer that we find in Scripture is new life. That Jesus has risen from the grave. That he has been resurrected from the dead. And because of that, we too live a new life. In Colossians chapter 3, we are clothed in Christ. We participate in this new life. We are changed and transformed. We've experienced this grace. And so I want to wrap up my brief thoughts, and hopefully uh, they, they seem like something you can follow, um, with Psalm 116, this, last, uh, this psalm that we read earlier. And it's interesting because this psalm, is actually a thanksgiving uh, for recovery from illness. And I can't think of a more apt uh, chapter out of the book of Psalms to read right now as we're anticipating the resurrection of Christ, as we're reflecting on our own participation in that resurrection, and as we think about what does it mean to be a Christian in a time when we are waiting, when we are wondering what's going to happen next. So I'm going to read the whole chapter. It's just 19 verses, but bear with me. This is Psalm 116, 1 through 19. I love the Lord because he has heard my voice and my supplications, because he inclined his ear to me. Therefore, I will call on him as long as I live. The snares of death encompassed me. The pangs of Sheol laid hold on me. I suffered distress and anguish. Then I called on the name of the Lord. O Lord, I pray, save my life. Gracious is the Lord and righteous. Our God is merciful. The Lord protects the simple. When I was brought low, he saved me. Return, O my soul, to your rest. For the Lord has dealt bountifully with you, for you have delivered my soul from death. My eyes from tears, my feet from stumbling, I walk before the Lord in the land of the living. I kept my faith even when I said, I am greatly afflicted. I said in my consternation, everyone is a liar. What shall I return to the Lord for all his bounty to me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his faithful ones. O Lord, I am your servant. I am your servant, the child of your serving girl. You have loosed my bonds. I will offer to you a thanksgiving sacrifice and call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. In the courts of the house of the Lord, in your midst, O Jerusalem, praise the Lord. The Lord has already 
even as we're waiting now, freed us from affliction. The Lord has given us new life. And as we're clothed, clothed in Christ, God calls us to serve him, to love well, to sacrifice well, to hope in him. So as we're going this week about our way in the world, let's claim the resurrection life together. Let's clothe ourselves in Christ and realize that new life doesn't begin for us when we die a physical death. We're already participating in that new life now. Let it empower us to be the kind of people who can be a light of hope while the rest of the world is waiting, wondering what is going to happen next. Let us be the kind of people who will be present and beside them as we wait with them and we say boldly, new life is on the horizon. Let's claim the resurrection. Let's clothe ourselves in Christ. This is why we have the hope we have. I hope you're doing well. I hope you're staying healthy. Um, as Mark reminds us, I hope that you're practicing your social distancing. You're washing your hands frequently. Um, I am praying for all of you. I'm so thankful for this community. Uh, and this week, uh, I'm especially thankful for Benjamin Weeb. And I am praying for Mark and Jocelyn and Margo and Isla. And um, I cannot wait uh, to meet him uh, soon. So I hope you have a good week. And I hope you enjoy this strange time of Easter <laughs> that we're having right now. I love you all, and I hope to see you soon. Let's pray together. Dear Lord, we're so thankful for this grand story that you have given us. A story that spans from the beginning of the cosmos to its restoration that we all long for. And Lord, we're so thankful that you have called us, that you have invited us to be a part of this story, that through your Son, we can be your children, that we can join you in restoring this world and bringing other people into relationship with you, Lord. And we ask that as you have tremendously blessed us in this way, that you turn us and transform us into the kind of people that spread that blessing to others. Lord, we ask that you give us courage during this time, that you give us hope, that you give us listening ears, and you give us creativity as we consider how to minister to this world as we're sitting in quarantine from each other right now or as we're sheltering at home. We ask and pray that you're with those of us in our congregation who are vulnerable, and we pray that you're with those who are sick. Lord, we ask that your presence be made known to them. In your Son's name we pray. Amen. When I survey the wondrous cross On which the Prince of Glory died my richest gain I count but loss And poor contempt on all my pride Forbidden, Lord, that I should boast Save in the death of Christ my Lord. All the vain things that charm me most, I sacrifice them to his blood. See from his head, his hands, his feet, sorrow and love flow mingled down. Did e'er such love and sorrow meet? Forth 
acorns compose so rich a crown. Were the whole realm of nature mine, that were a present far too small, love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. Good morning, everyone. I'm so honored to be with you on this special day. For our communion meditation this Easter Sunday, I'd like to share a combination of thoughts on resurrection from pastors Nadia Woltz Weber and Fiona Lynn. Woltz Weber calls Mary Magdalene the patron saint of showing up. On that dark Friday, when Jesus was hung up on a cross on a hill outside of Jerusalem, his body broken and bloody, the life seeping out of him, Mary Magdalene showed up when most of his followers had scattered. She stayed through to the bitter end and even beyond. Together with the other women, she watched him die. She accompanied his body as it was taken down from the cross and placed in a borrowed tomb. She saw the stone rolled across the entrance. In the time of greatest loss and despair, when it seems that there is no hope left, Mary Magdalene shows up. She rises before dawn and makes her way back to the tomb, to what needs to be done, when she hears her name and gets the surprise of a lifetime. Mary, Jesus said, and she turned to him and cried out, Rabbani, it was when he spoke her name that she recognized him. We know from John ten three and 4 that the sheep listen to the shepherd's voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. He goes on ahead of them, and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. Mary knows Jesus. She recognizes him, and he knows her. We too recognize the risen Jesus when we hear our names called, when he speaks them to us. The beautiful thing about this moment, though, is not just that Mary recognizes Jesus, but I believe in that moment she also is able to recognize herself, her true self, the way she was created to be, the way she can now be. Resurrection is so entirely confusing and bewildering. The church is still today trying to figure out exactly how and why and what happened that Easter Sunday morning. It is unprecedented, astonishing. But even while we stand there in the garden with Mary, our eyes wide in surprise and confusion, we sense that something has shifted. Something has changed eternally in the world and in us. Nadia Boltz Weber tells us that God simply keeps reaching down into the dirt of our humanity and resurrecting us from the graves we dig for ourselves through our violence, our lies, our selfishness, our arrogance, and our addictions. And God keeps loving us back to life over and over. For Christians, resurrection is not just something that happened to Jesus one Sunday 2,000 years ago. It's not just a hope we have for some day in the future when we might live again after our deaths. It's also something that's happening in us every single day of our lives when we hear our names called and turn and recognize the risen Jesus. So on this Resurrection Sunday, I ask, where do you need to experience resurrection in your life? Where has death entered and made its home? What do you need to leave in the tomb today so that you may rise to a new life? As Boltz Weber reminds us, we experience resurrection in a hundred small and powerful ways every day, and it all begins when we stop to listen and hear our names being called by the risen Lord. Jesus' continued presence in the world became his spirit working through us to bring healing and resurrection to the world around us. It starts with us, in us bringing life to the places in our hearts and minds where there is death and rotting, so we in turn can help bring resurrection and life to the world and people whom we live among. May God bless and keep you all until we can be together again. Almighty God, by the Passover of your Son, you have bought us out of sin into righteousness and out of death into life. Grant to those who are sealed by your Holy Spirit the will and the power to proclaim you to all the world through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let all creation give thanks to the risen Lord. Give thanks to the risen Lord. Filled with his praises, give thanks to the risen Lord. Give thanks to the risen Lord. He is our shepherd and we are his sheep. Give thanks to the risen Lord. 
Give thanks to the risen Lord. Stepping out boldly, we proclaim resurrection. Give thanks to the risen Lord. Give thanks to the risen Lord.